The Costa Concordia was one of the biggest and most luxurious cruise ships ever built. It was so large that you couldn't imagine something so big floating in the sea. It was magical. It just didn't seem like it could be real. Costa Concordia da Compa Mare Livorno. But on Friday the 13th in January 2012, just hours after leaving port, disaster struck. It was so terrifying. The boat went one way and went the other way. There was just a silent acknowledgement that we were all going to die. Dozens of people lost their lives. The ship's captain became the focus for worldwide blame. How could you, as a captain, leave thousands of people? And scandal engulfed the story. Captain Scatino had a young woman with him on the ship, a very beautiful blonde woman. Years later, the full truth about the disaster is still emerging. And over the next two nights, we'll tell you what really happened and why. As soon as flooding occurred, the ship was in a, a serious situation. Using new evidence, we'll ask, was justice really done? You don't want the story to become something about the company. It has to be one person's mistake. I think he was treated badly. I don't think he should have been standing there alone. The mystery of the Costa Concordia is about to be solved. January 2012, the west coast of Italy. Tourists are about to set sail on Europe's largest and most lavish cruise liner. I was visiting the Concordia as a passenger because my boyfriend, Claudio, was an engineer officer on the Concordia, so I was there visiting him for a week's holiday at the beginning of January. I was a really happy, bubbly, confident 21-year-old. My husband, Barry, had passed away three weeks after being diagnosed with lung cancer. So it had been a pretty bad year. So we booked the cruise and we were really excited about going on it. There was myself, my daughter, Karen, and my two grandchildren. We all went together. I received a phone call. He was a fellow musician, a colleague of mine. And this friend of mine asked me to replace him on board of a cruise ship. I've been always dreaming of traveling and playing my piano. So I accepted this offer and I embarked on this journey and it was uh, the crowning of my childhood dreams. I was a dancer, so professionally performing in the shows on board the ship. I was on board the Costa Concordia for what would be a six-month contract. It's a complete lifestyle and work at the same time. Built by Costa Cruises as the flagship of its fleet, the Concordia is the length of almost three football pitches. It weighs 56,000 tonnes and carries more than 4,000 passengers and crew. When I saw the Costa Concordia, I was blown away by how large and massive it was. It was, it was an incredible ship. It was so large that you couldn't imagine something so big floating in the sea. It was spectacular. I was aware of the Costa fleet, and there seems to have been some kind of competition to have the biggest ship at sea, to have the grandest ship at sea. Her length overall was around 290 metres. Imagine standing next to a high-rise block of flats, which is 17 storeys high. That's the height of the top deck. Costa Concordia was a very large ship compared with the Titanic. It was much wider, much taller. On a large cruise ship, it always looks as if, how does it stay up and what was keeping that ship stable? Uh, and the reason is that all the weight of the ship is in the bottom of the ship, where the engines are, where the fuel is and where the water ballast is. Inside, the Concordia boasts 1,500 cabins, 58 suites, four swimming pools, a giant fitness center, and a movie theater. 
There were elevators inside, there were pools on the decks, there were waterfalls inside. It was incredibly glamorous. There was even an entire casino, ballroom, and several restaurants inside the ship. The capo commissario, or detto all'anglosassone, all, all, l'hotel director della nave. Quindi l'hotel director cosa fa? È un po' il coordinatore di tutto il reparto alberghiero. Se uno vedeva questa nave a Canza era immensa questa nave. A large ship sells holidays because then you have more entertainment on board, there's more theatres, there's casinos, but it's always a fine balance between business and safety. There's always concerns raised as to what would happen if a ship of Costa Concordia's size was to get into trouble and you were going to have to get those passengers off uh, in an emergency because it had never actually been done before. And we always have the question in our head, when will this stop? At what point will we stop making ships bigger? Will, will there be a realisation sometime that we're doing the wrong thing? On January 13th, Concordia is docked at the port of Civita Vecchia, near Rome. It's about to embark on a seven-day cruise around the Mediterranean, stopping at ports in three different countries. I was out for the day, and that whole day I didn't want to get back on the cruise ship. I don't know why, and I remember saying to Claudio, oh, why don't we just stay here? And he was like, no, don't be silly, you have to get back on the cruise ship. But I really didn't want to. Siamo, eh, abbiamo, ci siamo staccati dal, dal porto di Civita, di Civita, tempo ottimo, condizioni veramente ottimali di navigazione. Sì, allora siamo partiti da Civita Vecchia che dovevamo fare rotta Savona. I bar erano sempre molto affollati, specialmente dopo dalle 7 di sera in poi, un po' per gli aperitivi, un po' per questo. The captain for the cruise is 51-year-old Francesco Scatino. My impression of Captain Francesco Scatino was that he was very severe. He had a, very, a gravitas about him, a seriousness. He was also very friendly to passengers. He seemed a little bit charming to the women. Ma il capitano Scatino è stato già eh, di per sé stesso una persona molto molto aperta, molto spiritosa, molto gioiosa, proprio come caratterialmente. Era molto molto tranquillo, ecco, molto tranquillo, sereno. Allegro. I know Captain uh, Scatino very well. This uh, very uh, special occasion. He descends from the bridge and he greets everyone and he's always available for a picture and he's making speeches in several languages, welcoming everyone on board and so on and so forth. It's been smooth sailing so far, but the ship is about to change course setting in motion a series of events that will change maritime history. E, e quindi ero nel mio ufficio, però il comandante poi mi aveva chiamato perché lui aveva fatto aveva detto che voleva passare davanti a fare questo passaggio dell'isola del Giglio se eh, andavo con lui sul ponte di comando a fare questo a valdere il Giglio. Era un passaggio più ravvicinato in maniera tale che vedevano questa maestosità di nave, queste luci che, che erano sospese in acqua sull'acqua, passare davanti a questa isola, isola del Giglio. A salute or a cruise by, as I would refer to it, is where you go close to an island. It's an added bonus to the cruise, which isn't usually in the brochure. But it's a risk you would only do if the weather was good, you had good visibility, uh, and you'd properly managed and assessed the navigational risks that the vessel would face. The consequence of hitting a rock is severe. Now, as you move closer to the island, the probability increases. So yes, there are definitely dangers involved with it. After dinner, we went back to the cabin 
And because it was going to be my last night, we wanted to just spend time together. So we watched a movie. Essendo sul ponte di comando, io ero sulla letta sinistra, proprio la letta, diciamo, la parte del ponte di comando più vicina alla terra. E noi stavamo osservando dal ponte questa isola che man mano che la nave avanzava si avvicinava. A un certo punto io mi sono reso conto che eravamo molto vicini all'isola. I started my shift at half past nine in this very fancy, elegant bar called Vienna Bar, located on, the, on the deck five, where most of the amenities were. E poi una cosa che mi ha stupito molto era l'alta velocità della nave durante questo passaggio. E io ero rimasto mezzo scioccato, non, proprio, non sapevo più cosa... At 9.42 p.m. I remember I was in the middle of an improvisation. Peering through the portal, I realized it was a, a starry night, a beautiful starry night. The sea was calm, the visibility was ideal for navigation. A parte eh, la frase tipica che ci ha detto al, al, al mio amico eh, Metre, guarda che qua stiamo sugli scogli. E lui mi ha risposto, ma no, guarda che il comandante è bravo. E sarà anche bravo, ma non ho finito neanche di dire la frase che abbiamo battuto, abbiamo, abbiamo avuto un impatto con, con lo scoglio. There was a massive, like, thud, and then um, the TV fell off the wall. I couldn't utter words. This was the very beginning of the nightmare. With more than 4,000 passengers and crew on board, Costa Concordia's giant hull has struck an outcrop of rocks while sailing close to the Italian island of Giglio. The ship took a sudden swerve, and this made me fall from the bench. And also the piano was literally torn off the safety latches, locks and started drifting, reeling around the room. Immobile, non riuscivo più a avere una... a ragionare, non riuscivo più a avere una cosa razionale di me stesso. 75 miles away on the Italian mainland, the Livorno Coast Guard receives the first reports of a ship in distress. Una signora aveva telefonato alla propria figlia e le aveva detto che a bordo della nave su cui lei stava facendo la crociera eh, si era verificato un blackout, la nave era al buio. Se avevano saputo che era una nave che si trattava di una nave della costa crociera, non il nome. Con il sistema AIS Automatic Identification System, un sistema di rapportazione navale, ovviamente è come cercare un ago in un pagliaio, ci vuole tempo. On the right, or starboard side, of the Concordia, passenger Amelia Bland is on deck zero, just above the waterline. The corridor is pitch black, except for emergency lights on the floor. Due to an electrical fault, which is currently under control, we are currently in a blackout. Our technicians are working to resolve the situation and will inform you of developments as they occur. Thank you for your attention. I remember saying to my boyfriend, Claudio, you need to take me up to the deck. I can't be down here. And so we went through the corridor and then um, through the crew area. That's when Claudio left me um, in the passenger area on the deck um, to go down and investigate. I stumbled along corridors, very sloping corridors, to reach the center, the center of the ship, where this uh, huge dance floor was. People, they started losing control, just screaming and calling out names. I would spot some of them 
reeling around the tilting room. Some of them were holding broken teeth in their hands and bleeding from falls. This was like uh, being in a Dante's Inferno scene. Ladies and gentlemen, your attention please. I speak on behalf of the captain. At this point, the situation is under control and our technicians are working to solve the situation. We'll give you further information as it becomes available. There was an announcement telling people to go back to their cabins and not to worry. And then Claudio comes back up to me. I'd never really seen him like this. He wasn't his calm self. He was very concerned and full of panic. And he said to me, um, the engine room is flooding and that we are going to have to get off the ship. Panic isn't the only thing that's spreading across the Concordia. On the ship's bridge, the captain and his crew are desperately trying to contain the flooding. On board a ship the size of Costa Concordia, the lower areas of the ship are divided into compartments which are each watertight. It's usual that two compartments can be flooded uh, and the ship stay afloat. Above two and into three, you are in a very serious situation. It will be completely unstable. We're carrying a lot more weight, ultimately, possibly, leading to the ship being lost, sinking or capsizing. Everything went crashing. Everything was just smashing around, just, just smashing. Uh, then the boat went one way and went the other way. <laughs> then I was scared. <laughs> then some emergency lights came on. The ground beneath us was shaking and this moaning was going on. Everything around us was smashing to the ground. It was as if time stopped. There was screaming, there was chaos. It was so terrifying. And we hoped and prayed that it was true, but they were saying that it was just an electrical problem. You know, this ship can't be, it can't be can it? On the Italian mainland, the Coast Guard manages to make radio contact with the Concordia, but the ship makes no mention of flooding. Le persone, sia l'equipaggio che i passeggeri, sono già allertati e posizionati in certi posti ben definiti, in, in, pronti a eventuale evacuazione dalla nave. Ecco perché deve essere dato una certa tempestività. We were waiting for the captain's boys to give some explanation about this over the PA system. At that time I would uh, trust Captain Schettino, say, in the back of my mind, I know you, so come on, push that button and say something. People are waiting for you. But we didn't hear any captain's voice. Concordia's engineers have been below deck to examine the damage to the hull and discovered that at least three of the ship's watertight compartments have been ripped open. My superior officer, this engineer, he was the last one out of the engine room. 
He was soaked in water up to his neck. If you breach your watertight compartments and you've lost your main engines, you've lost control of your vessel. It's a huge thing. We're in an unprecedented territory and you're dealing with a situation which no master would want to face and, uh, and, and certainly one that you wouldn't wish on anyone. La prua volta a sud. Ora la nave che è diretta a Savona doveva avere la prua a nord. E da un po' di tempo la nave, sotto l'effetto del, del vento, stava scarrocciando verso l'isola. 0,2 miglia, diciamo 350-400 metri, troppo vicina all'isola del Giglio. Se ci pensiamo alla parte di una cruise ship, è molto sheer, è molto tall. That acts like a sail. Quando you lose propulsion close to an island and you have the effects of tide and wind, you're being pushed towards that island, you're going to strike land. We were trying to get to the outside to find out what was happening. Karen was leading. Uh, people were going in all directions. Karen said to me, don't go up, because there was a staircase going up. She said, don't go up. And then I lost her. I just stood still. I just didn't know what to do. People were screaming, there were people crying, there was people running. It was just chaos. Just chaos. I was worried. Where was Karen and, and the children? You know, I, I didn't know where they disappeared to. Alle 22.26 da bordo confermano c'è una falla. La nave ha urtato qualcosa. Che non ci dessero tutta la descrizione della situazione. Ci metteva parecchio in andare. Se da, da Livorno all'isola di Giglio c'è una distanza di 75 miglia. Facciamo uscire immediatamente le motovedette da Santo Stefano e allerta gli elicotteri, che avevamo migliaia di persone. Quindi sì, la preoccupazione c'era ed era tantissima. I was getting angry knowing that I don't know why we're still here on the cruise ship. I don't know why we haven't got off yet, when clearly there's something going on. Almost an hour after the ship hit rocks, the captain finally raises a general emergency. Eventually, the general emergency signal was sounded. It was a kind of uh, generalized feeling of panic, the sensation of losing something, in this case, probably losing our lives. But Concordia's problems are about to get much worse. Just minutes later, the drifting ship reaches Giglio Island, and its huge weight comes to rest against an underwater rock shelf. It lurches violently to starboard and begins to capsize. When we had hit the land, we had severely tipped to the other direction. I wasn't able to stand on the ground because we were so far tilted. So being worried that I could just like fall off the ship and, and into the ocean and, and I was so high up I would have hit it like concrete, I rearranged myself to the other side of the ship, which is now the side of the ship that was up, up in the air. I was by the restaurant and the doors were flying open and um, like trolleys of food and the tables were like coming through the doors and like smashing everywhere. One of the waiters had cut his head from um, things falling down on him. It was bleeding really bad. We chiamo il comandante del uh, chiamo via radio il comandante della nave. Lui conferma che la nave era appoppata. Quindi vuol dire che l'acqua che entrava era tanta. Lo sbandamento stava aumentando. A bordo ci si doveva preparare per mettere a mare le scialuppe. I was on the side of the ship that was tilting upwards. It was just going up and up. Um, of course, I was anxious where, you know, where Karen and where the children were. 
I thought, this is it. I thought, this is it. This is curtains. Uh, we're all going to die on here. Um, and I actually did say, yeah, I should speak to you, to yourself. I said, Barry, please be there. Please. Sorry. Please be there for us. We're going to be with you soon. More than an hour after hitting rocks, and with more than 4,000 people still on board, Europe's largest cruise ship, the Costa Concordia, is capsizing on the edge of Giglio Island in Italy. The commandant of the Carabinieri, of the station, told me that there was a ship in difficulty out of Giglio Porto. I took my clothes, I put my jacket in my impermeable, e l'impatto è stato incredibile perché una nave così grande proprio addosso agli scogli è stato veramente una cosa e mi sono fatto portare dalla scialuppa di Sal Primo che era arrivata al porto mi sono fatto riportare verso la costa Concordia. On the ship, passengers and crew are finally instructed to get into lifeboats. It's more than an hour since flooding began. The order to abandon ship will only be given once that is the only option which is left, and you have no, no alternative other than to get everyone off the ship into those boats and away into sea. A lifeboat should be able to be launched within 30 minutes of the abandoned ship uh, order. The ship can no longer support you. It can't support life anymore. You have to leave the vessel. The abandoned ship command was ordered from the bridge. It was not the captain's voice, because I, I know the captain's voice. It was not him. The command was ordered, and everyone started scattering around like crazy sparks from an explosion. E quindi la gente era tutto c'era un panico pazzesco, non sapevano, non sapevano proprio cosa fare. I was expecting an authority from the bridge, an officer, to take myself and my group of life raft people to our designated life raft. No one came and uh, everyone started asking me, where is the officer, where is the officer? Vedo che più mi avvicino e più la vedo più grande. Diventa incredibile, diventa grossa. Allora, eh, quando sono salito, sono messo solo a aiutare queste persone a montare sulle scialuppe di salvataggio. E non avevano bisogno proprio di una figura che li chiamasse e che, che, che li guidasse. On the starboard, or right side of the ship, which is tilting into the water, launching lifeboats is a huge challenge. The introduction of list and the ship leaning over is the thing that you fear most. The distance between the lifeboat and the water uh, reduces and reduces, and ultimately will get to the point where the lifeboat can't be released. <laughs> The way that the boat had um, been tilting, some of the lifeboats people couldn't get to and then were out of use. So obviously you had to get like twice the amount of people onto a lifeboat. <laughs> there was a lot of pushing and shoving and cramming and people wanting to get on there first. People weren't thinking about other people. I had to abandon the ship, but I didn't know how. There was no life raft for me, because my designated life raft was already submerged, was already underwater. I instinctively decided to uh, call my wife 
she was uh, she was home. She was sleeping with our daughter Sophia. He was kind of coping with the moment. I was just fooling myself, pretending everything was okay. Just a normal conversation between a man and his wife. She realized that I was co I was calling her because I was in the middle of something. And so she didn't trust me. But I had to turn my uh, phone off, say, okay, I'll call you later on. And uh, it was a very difficult moment. Uh, this moment brought me to, to tears, actually. It was the very first uh, beginning of my personal uh, nightmare. Coast Guard rescue teams from the mainland have arrived at the scene. We had the problems that you saw there. Contemporaneously, at that point, there were also helicopters with visors in the night. The temperature of the water at that period was about 12 or 11, 12 or 13 degrees at the maximum. I don't remember, but more or less, this is the temperature media. When one comes to know that there is a person who falls in the water, or is thrown in the water, is thrown in the water, in quella stagione significa che la permanenza lì assolutamente in termini temporali modestissimi la permanenza in vita on deck 4 on the ship's port side which is rising out of the water passengers are still waiting to get into lifeboats it was like a miracle because then i seen karen I seen him and the children. I couldn't believe it. It was fantastic. We were put into the lifeboat. And when they did eventually start to lower it, it was impossible. We lowered so far and it stopped. Because of the tilt of the ship was so bad, it was impossible to lower it. That was a real terrifying part. <laughs> On the side of the ship where you're leaning away from the water and you're going to have to slide the lifeboats down the, the side of the ship, uh, the situation is, is, is much more hazardous. It's a much longer drop down the side of the ship, scraping down the ship's side before you're eventually getting into the water. People were screaming, people were crying. My grandchild, one of them, was crying. Uh, the other one just sat there rigid. <laughs> there was oars on the roof of the lifeboat, and they got these oars from the roof, and they prized us inch by inch from the, from the boat, and we'd swing out to sea and then back, and inch by inch, we got down that way. At this point, there was no way off the ship for myself and the other four members that I, of crew that I ended up stranded with. We were on the front part of the ship, and it's the fourth deck, it's open. Now, because we were tilting, we couldn't get from this front part of the ship, we couldn't get into the ship where any of the lifeboats were, where any of the life rafts were. So we were now stranded. We were so high up that we couldn't even jump into the water because we would have broken all of our bones. As the rescue mission continues, the Coast Guard loses radio contact with Concordia's bridge. Costa Concordia da Compa Mare Livorno. The bridge is the nerve centre of the ship. During an emergency, the captain should be on the bridge. That's where the information is coming into. That's where the captain has to be to be able to process that information and coordinate the emergency, both on board and with the rescue services ashore. Avevano abbandonato la bridge. Peraltro senza dirlo. Non era più sicuramente quello che avremmo potuto sperare. C'è un abbandono nave ordinato, ma era ormai una tragedia conclamata. 
once you lose the bridge and the, the central position for all communications, both internal and external, it, it falls apart very quickly. <laughs> cercato fra i membri dell'equipaggio che trovavo la mia missione era trovare un ufficiale che mi portava dal comandante tutto questo tempo io non ho mai visto e mai sentito il capitano della nave unable to locate the captain by radio at half past midnight coast guard de falco calls his mobile Avevo dato ordine ed era stato vericellato a bordo ed erano stati vericellati a bordo della nave due aerosoccorritori, poi il terzo fu vericellato dopo. The last working lifeboats have left the Concordia, but hundreds remain on board. When we got onto the lifeboat, I remember looking back and the cruise ship was looking so dark and you could see how much it had tilted. You could see people swimming in the sea to get to the shore. D'altra parte, nel momento in cui avevamo saputo che le, le persone stavano cadendo, si stavano buttando, perché era, era inevitabile che ci fossero vittime a quel punto. I suddenly thought about being a father. I wanted to be a father for my daughter. I found a loose winch. So I grabbed the winch, holding to it tightly, and I started sliding toward the hull of the ship, waiting for some rescue. I could see that there were land, I could see tiny twinkling lights. However, everything else was pretty much pitch black. I saw a couple of coffins floating in the water, which presumably people had thrown out of the mortuary to use as flotation devices because people weren't able to get to life jackets. At this point, I looked at the, my fellow four members and there was just a silent acknowledgement that we were all going to die. Gilio Island's tiny harbour has swelled with thousands of passengers who've managed to escape the capsizing Concordia. Most by lifeboat, but many by swimming to shore. We must have been one of the last lifeboats, I think, because there was loads and loads of life jackets stacked up. We lost everything. All we brought off the ship is what we were dressed in. We went into a church. People gave us blankets to wrap around us and there was curtains in the church and I remember like wrapping myself around the curtain to keep warm. 
Despite being urged to return to his ship, the Concordia's captain, Francesco Scatino, is among those who've reached dry land. On the Concordia, a frantic operation to save lives is underway. It's focused on the ship's port side, where desperate passengers are scrambling onto the hull to await rescue. We were prompted to jump into this little rescue boat from the hull of the ship. I close my eyes and I say, okay, this is the final step. I need to do this, I need to abandon the ship. And finally, I jumped. And <laughs> believe me, it was jumping into this little lifeboat was like jumping back to life. But not everyone has made it onto Concordia's hull and away to safety. On the outside at the front of the ship, dancer Rose Metcalf and four colleagues are still stranded. We were going down with the ship at this point. We were just sinking. I turned around, I looked at my fellow crew members and I said, we need to get higher. We began uh, climbing and we came to a window ledge that it was on its side and I was using my fingertips and I was gouging my fingertips into the side of the window ledge to try and make it across uh, to get higher and my legs were free swinging. It was an, a petrifying moment and I was so high up, it's like being on the side of uh, a, a, a sky rise building, just with my fingertips on a ledge and my, my legs swinging. And if I'd, have, if I'd have fallen, I would have died. On deck four inside the ship, Giglio Deputy Mayor Mario Pellegrini and a member of crew are still searching for passengers. Se non che sentiamo una voce, delle voci che gridano dentro un, un corridoio. Noi dobbiamo pensare che i corridoi che passano di qua, una volta girati, sono come pozzi. Dentro c'erano molti bambini. Erano questi bambini il terrore sul volto di le bambini. Piangevano, piangevano ma non gridavano. Questi occhi pieni di lacrime li ho ancora impressi. E non è facile riscolare. At this moment, I suddenly thought of my parents, and they had lost two children already as I was growing up. And I knew I couldn't die because of the ramification it would have on my parents, that my, my parents just couldn't lose another child. It was as if connected to my life was my parents' life, that if I died, they would die. As a desperate search for survivors gets underway, there were body bags and young victims and all these sorts of horrific stories. They find my brother trapped in there, not alive. The ship's captain takes all the blame. The company were very quick, it seemed, to distance themselves from the disaster. Captain Scatino was accused of multiple manslaughter, uh, abandoning his ship and for causing a shipwreck. But as Judgment Day approaches, surprise new witnesses emerge. All of a sudden, everybody's chasing the story of the Moldovan dancer. 
and the full truth about the Costa Concordia is revealed. I later found out that the officers who were on the bridge were on the telephone with Costa. I started to ask myself the question, what's going on here? There's been an error here. And those secrets of the wreck are revealed brand new tomorrow at nine. Rob Bell takes us on a journey uncovering one of the world's greatest mysteries. Join him brand new Thursday at nine for the Stonehenge enigma, What Lies Beneath. Next night, two builders are rushed into casualty 24-7 after a roof collapsed under them. They're in the best of hands, that's for sure. <laughs>